Before 1900, doctors had not understood why some transfusions caused bad reactions and even death. Landsteiner thought there might be different kinds of human blood. From studying these results, it was found that there are four different kinds of human blood, or four blood groups. Landsteiner's discovery solved one major difficulty standing in the way of successful blood transfusion, but another remained. Blood was uh, highly coagulable. The addition of citrate helped maintain the blood in a liquid fashion. Russian physicians pioneered the collection and storage of cadaver blood. A triumph in the study of blood is a new test that detects the mysterious RH blood factor. There are probably hundreds of blood types. The push to separate whole blood into its individual components really started blood banking. Blood plasma, a recent and important discovery of medical science, provides a permanent bank for use in transfusion. Furnished by volunteer civilian donors, the blood plasma may be stored indefinitely and given to any patient without risk. men and women are donating blood for the Red Cross National Blood Bank to furnish plasma for emergency transfusion. Researchers are now looking frantically for acceptable and plentiful substitutes for plasma. Instead of the traditional easily breakable glass bottle, whole blood to be shipped is today enclosed in unbreakable plastic containers. Dr. Cooley has done thousands of cases of cardiac surgery without transfusion. All these men down here, they only get $5 a pint for their blood, but we're striking this blood bank. You had virtually a 100% chance of acquiring hepatitis B from being transfused. We're going to have a million outpatient visits a year from AIDS and AIDS-related illness. I will do all that God gives us the power to do to find a cure for AIDS. But now we know every one of us could be devastated by it. That they had a medication that was infected with the AIDS virus. They took the product off the market in the US and then they dumped it in France, Europe, Asia, and Latin America. Every time we make blood safe, that step is going to add cost and at the same time may not guarantee us complete protection. If you get my blood, you will now have my DNA. So we are dramatically expanding the use of DNA evidence to prevent wrongful conviction. For the first time in its history, the National Security Council got directly involved in combating a virus, HIV. The government's scientific committee recommended the use of a filter for transfusion. When is the government going to react to that recommendation? Uh, that recommendation is obviously very important for the future of the blood transfusion service. I will look at it very carefully and I'll get back to it. 200 million units of donated blood are needed worldwide. 80 million transfusions are administered each year. The shrinking donor availability means global blood resources are in short supply.
We as physicians have all taken a very basic oath, and that is a Hippocratic oath, and it's to try to do good for mankind, and it also has the corollary of first do no harm. Above all, do no harm. It makes a lot of sense to think of it as a first principle of healthcare. When it comes to blood transfusion, it seems as though we have not really understood that in that we've never done the basic research to know when we're doing good and when we're doing harm. Many would say, and there is a large worry, that this therapeutic, among the world's most common administered therapeutics, millions upon millions of units transfused worldwide may make people worse in many instances. And this is a great, great concern. The scientific evidence has been slow in coming to document the fact that transfusion alters a lot of things in, in the organism and it has long-term side effects. It's, a, it's some kind of a very gross modality of treatment. You give a bag of blood, and the bag of blood has all sorts of things in it, and we ignore them. Blood transfusion came into medical practice virtually through the back door. Normally, therapies or medication used in modern medical practice would have been tried, and then it would be licensed. Blood transfusion has never undergone randomized clinical trials to the level at which a new drug would have to go through the FDA. It's never been done. Doctors try a whole lot of stuff, but if they're knowingly harming a patient, and by harm, I think I mean all things considered, the patient is worse off as a consequence of having this intervention, then that's a betrayal of medicine. My plea to any prospective patient is always to ask, ask why? What is the likelihood that a transfusion will be required What's gonna to happen to me either if I have it or if I don't have it? In the early days of asepsis in Vienna, Austria, Dr. Schemmelweis noticed that the midwives had many fewer infections than did the physicians who often were touching many different patients or even actually coming from the morgue. The docs would go from the autopsy room into a delivery room, didn't change the gloves, didn't change the coats, didn't wash their hands, just went from one table to the other. The physicians had a horrible death rate related to post-delivery sepsis of the moms. Same population of moms, midwives were delivering mothers. Their death rate was much less. Some of goes, well, why are they having less sepsis, less illness and morbidity? And made the simple observation that you need to wash your hands between patients. He introduced that idea to his team and said, okay, here's what we're gonna do. We're just gonna wash. Just use regular antiseptic uh, solution and wash, and his moms started surviving at much higher rates. There was no basis for anyone to believe him, plus he was a pretty colorful character, apparently, as well. And what he was suggesting just sounded outrageous, even though he did have evidence. He had data. Las observaciones de Semmelweis eh, son observaciones de sentido común. Eh, 
son observaciones de la vida diaria, son observaciones de alguien inteligente que está tratando de ver algo y sin embargo en su tiempo fueron rechazadas, objetadas y, y, y su autor perseguido. He was drummed out of the business, basically, because it was not traditional. The uh, influence of the politics and the fraternity of medical professionals at the time was such that it was simply unacceptable to consider that anything so simple could be the reason for the difference in survival. People are actually thinking it is all due to demons or devils coming in, till a simple solution somehow is brought in of hand washing, and that prevented all the sepsis. So that's a simple solution. So many things in medicine may have a simple solution, but people are reluctant to accept because something is simple. The Slimmer Weiss principle is the knee-jerk rejection of anything new, uh, because again, it challenges the norms. Now that evolution of that thought of, well, there's a connection here, can I improve outcome, could actually translate into what happens in transfusion. It serves to illustrate the bias that we physicians have, which is that we really, truly believe in what we know, in the way things are done now. And it's the biggest challenge, I think, to practicing physicians to always be aware of and awake to the possibility that something better is coming along, something new and different, maybe even something contrary to, to what we believe is the right thing to do. We have to always be open to consider a new idea, even if it flies in the face of everything we think is true. In the present war, prompt administration of plasma has saved the lives of many victims of explosion burns and lacerations. There clearly are benefits to transfusion. I've written books about it. I've transfused probably thousands of patients in my career. I know I've saved lives with transfusion. Unfortunately, medicine has taken to heart this public perception of give a unit of blood, save a life. Every two seconds, someone in this country needs blood. I needed 987 pints of blood to live. All of the physicians who practice are brought up in the society where they hear ever since birth the public relations message of save this child's life, donate a unit of blood. They don't hear the very difficult academic discussion of when to give a unit of blood and when not to. When you talk to lay people, lay people think we know exactly what we're doing and, and when to start, how much to give, what to give, and when to stop. And in fact, in, from a data-driven fashion, we don't know those things. We have historically been trained that um, blood is good. There is nothing um, but benefit by transfusing patients. In the healthcare system, um, blood was something you gave out like you gave out aspirin. It was something we did without even giving it a second thought. At the moment, uh, you can, uh, a physician can request blood on any patient. In the 70s, I remember, Кому мы только не переливали кровь, там, у человека какой-то упадок сил, мы ему назначали переливание крови. Какое-то инфекционное заболевание, мы назначали ему переливание крови. Даже для лечения, вот, у юноши, которые появляются угри на лице, и то мы применяли переливание крови. Было такое тоже. Это во всем мире было такое. What has happened over the years is Things become embedded in medical practice by tradition. Some respected member of the community starts to do something and talks about it with his, his or her scientific colleagues, and they try it, and it seems to work for their patients, and so gradually the word spreads. 
we use this drug or therapeutic transfusion differently than any other therapeutic. We almost never give it to make a person better. That is to say, if we were to give it back freely and restore normal levels, I think most would agree patients would not do well. Many clinicians think of blood and blood components as a drug to treat specific conditions that patients have. Blood is a very complex organ that we transfuse as the means of transplanting it. Now, because of the ability to store and deliver blood on demand, this happens to be the only transplant uh, that all you require is essentially a couple of letters behind your name and a pen, and you can write for it. A blood transfusion is the only organ transplant that's done by a nurse. You know, a doctor writes it on a piece of paper, a nurse hangs it, it has huge implications for patients. There's been a tradition in medicine that when people order a unit of blood, uh, they were told by someone, uh, we still don't know who it was and what the reasons were, that if you're going to give a single unit of blood, there's no need to do that, you should give two. And for many decades, people order units of blood as a couple rather than a single. Every unit has its own risk, and the risks are additive. When everybody believed that transfusion was safe, it was incredibly easy and straightforward. Everybody could tell you a story of the person who got a two-unit transfusion and felt immediately better. I mean, everybody wanted to believe, and did believe, that the transfusion was a good thing. The mindset of most physicians is this is a benign, if not quite beneficial treatment that doesn't cost them anything, makes the patient think that they feel better, they look a little pinker, so it's all okay, because no one's gonna ask any questions anyway. If they're not challenged as to why they want that blood, as to as not challenged as to an alternative therapy, uh, then the blood is made available for them. And it's the line of least resistance. Tradition and empiricism really, uh, meaning we just started trying it out to see where we could use it and what were the consequences of that. And uh, all of this was done without anybody really saying, you know, shouldn't we study this to see what is the right circumstance for this to be used? How much do you need to give? When should it be given? Um, and it, it's, it's persisted through t till today. The establishment today would say that you can do pretty well without half of it. And I think the establishment needs to agree that we don't know if you can give it back in most circumstances and help you. So you can basically wait today in many places until you've lost half of your blood before anyone would give it back. It's interesting, right? You can lose half your blood and you don't give it back, and that's because we don't think we can make you better by giving it back unless you've lost at least half of your blood.